Ah, yes, greetings, hello, it is I, Rata, the Furry King of Awesome. Welcome to the Really Awesome Review Show. We're wrapping up the year 2017 in movies, a great year. This is kind of a precursor to our awesome top 20 movies of 2017. We're going to be doing the honorable mentions, the almost awesome movies. These are all rated excellent. Four stars out of our six star rating, as you can see over there. All right, so we're kicking it off here. You know, generally these are in order. Uh, we're talking first about Jigsaw. Now this is the eighth installment in the Saw franchise. This is kind of launching a new trilogy of it for the new era, for the millennials and, and so on. This is kind of encompassing John Kramer, AKA Jigsaw's legacy. The truth will set you free. This one has new team-ups and members to help him uh, because, you know, he's been dead, spoiler alert, for a long time now. Uh, and this is trying to say, like, how could this murder still be happening when he's been dead for so long? Uh, we thought it was a pretty cool, uh, you know, experiment. Uh, had a lot less gore than other ones, which we really liked. So had a really cool story, some good twists. This is built to you by the Spirit Brothers. Uh, so a little bit different uh, directing and writing style this time around. Definitely worth watching for Saw fans. And if you've never given uh, the Saw franchise a shot, you might want to give one this time to Jigsaw. The next effort in the monster universe that Legendary and Universal has been doing for a, a couple of times now. This is Kong, Scott Island. We are really excited about this one. It fell short a little bit of our expectations. Still some really cool creatures this time around. The characters were so-so, led by Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson. The main problem here was not King Kong, who is the biggest King Kong iteration that's ever been. He's like 200... <laughs> 300 feet tall or something ridiculous like that. Able to swat the helicopters out of the sky with little effort. Uh, able to wrestle faux dinosaurs and split them open. Uh, but the big problem here for us was Samuel L. Jackson's character is a little bit too driven to kill the beast. And we really didn't buy that. As you can see, Kong Skull Island was a decent sized hit in the US with 168 million, but worldwide continues to be a monster that audiences just really revel in its brute strength and power. This again being the biggest King Kong's ever been. They'll continue with that probably as they go further along in, in the series. So continuing the monster verse, they're going to have next Godzilla, King of the Monsters, I believe that's 2019. And then I believe in 2020 or 2021, they're gonna have a title match. Godzilla versus Kong. Speaking of slaying the beast, next up we have Disney's live action version of one of their old time classics, Beauty and the Beast. They had an all star cast led by Ewan McGregor and Sir Ian McKellen as some of your favorite magical inanimate objects. The candlestick and the clock. What we really enjoyed was it brought a lot of character development to characters like LeFou, played by Josh Gad, who is Gaston's gay sidekick. Also, Gaston was well casted with uh, Luke Evans playing the villain in a very tasty role. And then Dan Stevens was the beast. Now, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, it was a mistake to cast Emma Watson in another iconic role. No! She's Hermione in the Harry Potter saga, but this one, it seemed to work okay, but for us, a little bit distracting because, you know, this one I think should be done by someone much lesser known. Uh, this, of course, was the, one of the biggest hits of the year with critics and fans alike. Not just for the little girls, no, for everybody, families and people who just like enchanted tales of uh, creatures and, and inanimate objects that come to life. And as you can see there, I believe it was the number two highest grossing film right behind Star Wars at 504 million domestic and 1.3 billion worldwide. Yeah, big mega monies for the Disney Corporation who continue to take over the world. All right, next up is the, what, sixth installment in the Alien franchise. If you include Prometheus, which we do, and discount Alien vs. Predator duo, which we do as well. Alien Covenant had Catherine Waterston with terrible Sigourney Weaver Ripley hair and Billy Crudup and Danny McBride as some of the Expendable crew members. Michael Fassbender also returns for two roles. One is David and one is a new android. He does a great job in both ones. And it's really cool to see double the great actor on screen. Director Ridley Scott is back again to continue what he did in Prometheus in some ways. Otherwise, he discounts it, throws all the questions you had out, but has some cool alien uh, action scenes. 
Uh, lots of people doing dumb things all the time. These brilliant scientists making terrible, terrible decisions that ultimately get them killed. <laughs> That is the, one of the main reasons that left off the uh, awesome top 20 list. Because, again, we cannot keep taking these cliche things, you know, like in Prometheus, the guy who is a biologist or something, is very smart, he's scared of everything, and yet he wants to pet this crazy alien dick snake. <laughs> and <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. All right, so no. It was a modest hit, and they'll continue to make these until they get to the alien timeline, which I believe Ridley Scott said in about two more movies. We're looking forward to more, but please, enough of the stupidity. All right, well, now you might think this may be higher on our list. We thought maybe as well, also with the, the amazing talent of director Christopher Nolan, definitely one of our favorite directors of all time, behind, of course, David Fincher and Steven Spielberg. You know, he's up there, definitely, way, way up there. Christopher Nolan always brings his A-game. He's a master of storytelling and directing. Uh, and also writing, he writes a lot of stuff with his younger brother, Jonathan Nolan. He's here with a World War II epic, uh, with no character development, but uh, still a lot of heart and really cool tracking shots. Yes, that's one of the main problems Dunkirk has. The characters just didn't click with us. Okay, yeah, we have a couple of people that we like, the young guy... And then we have the pilot played by Tom Hardy. Okay, that's yes, pretty cool, but we don't really get to hear much about them. There's very little dialogue. We really didn't think it would work all the way. There are plenty of really cool action sequences and well done. This is definitely kind of a one of the better war movies up there with Saving Private Ryan. But again, for us, we wanted a little bit more uh, background on the this whole... It's basically a rescue attempt. Mark Rylance uh, is one of the characters, basically from a real-life perspective. The British people brought a lot of their own boats to rescue the soldiers who are pinned down by the enemy. They need to send more ships. Every hour the enemy pushes closer. We will definitely watch it again. We really enjoyed it. But for the lesser historians, it would be nice to fill in some of the parts that we really don't understand. And the motivations for these characters. We've got a true indie and an Academy Award bait movie, I, Tanya. Now, this is kind of the, based on the true story of Tanya Harding, who clubbed a poor, unfortunate Nancy Kerrigan in the Olympics. Uh, and this is her story. This time, Margot Robbie does an impressive job at playing the true life characterization of Tanya Harding. Sebastian Stan also does a great job as her longtime lover, husband, uh, violent sociopath. Uh, it's really interesting. You will definitely feel some empathy for this world class skater who couldn't really get past her trailer trash beginnings. Uh, also, the mom who has won some Academy Awards and other awards, played by Alison Johnny, is really funny. The editing is really smart. It's a dark, subversive comedy that doesn't really play how you would think. I never did this. It's very enjoyable, very entertaining. Some of these next ones barely missed the awesome top 20. We're coming into the home stretch here. Up next is a movie you probably never heard of. It is streaming on Netflix right now. It's called What Happened to Monday. Namuria Pross kind of does the orphan block role where she plays multiple character twin sisters. This is a dystopian world where they are not allowed to have more than one child and so they have to keep them in secret. Starting tomorrow, you will each get to go outside on the day of the week that is your name. We found this very refreshingly dark, just very exciting. You know, there's lots of uh, body count there. People don't always survive. We love the you know alternate histories and alternate futures kind of storylines all the time. We're big suckers for that. And Numera Paz is an amazing actress, and it's great to see her play you know, six, seven sisters. Uh, all with the different kind of personalities. We want to see a little bit more of their personalities at some point, but generally some cool action, kind of a lot of twists and darkness. I can see it rubbing some people the wrong way, but for us, it rubbed us the right way. Now we're on to a thriller that I really didn't expect a whole lot, but it really just drove home its quality. Wind River. This is the work of director Taylor Sheridan. It's mainly his first time directing a higher caliber film. The writer of this, as well as the critical and audience hits, Sicario, 
and Hell or High Water. Now, I actually liked Wind River more than both of those other films. They really just came together much more simply to me. This one stars Jeremy Renner as a wildlife tracker. He's the one who, you know, shoots the cougars and mountain lions so they don't eat all the sheep. Kind of a cock blocker that way, but I'll allow it this time because it turns out this is a career best for Jeremy Renner. He really displays a wealth of emotions, of sadness, and triumph and determination because of his dirty backstory. I won't go into it too much, but it, it hits home. This young Native American girl dying under suspicious circumstances. How do you gauge someone's will to live, especially in these conditions? But I knew that girl. She's a fighter. And an FBI agent who is totally a fish out of the water here uh, is played by Elizabeth Olsen, another career best Yes, she's young in her career, but this is clearly a high water mark so far. She ropes in Jeremy Renner to help her track these killers because she's out of her element and she doesn't know the snowy wildlife rich landscape of the Utah mountains. Also really cool to see the major Native American actor that you've seen before, Gil Birmingham. He's the father of the slain girl. We pay her for some heavy emotional stuff, but still, not just that all the way. I was surprised by the amount of excellent uh, camera work and thrilling uh, chases that were. Our heroes are in a major Mexican standoff. And they really did a great job shooting that. I also got to give a big applause for one of the best flashback transitions I've ever seen. It was so seamless. And uh, John Bernthal has a small role in there. And uh, he really shines in that moment. Yeah, so it was really nice to see this kind of unseen part of America, the Utah, Wyoming area that not a lot of people can see. It's very really deserted. It's very really remote. And they held this thrilling murder mystery there. I wish it went a little further into the inequalities of the culture and the way they are living, the socio-economic kind of level of it. I want to see a little bit more of that. This was one of the kind of Oscar-caliber movies that we saw late in the game in 2018, and we're glad we saw it because now it has a place on our really excellent list. We really didn't know what to expect much from life. It had a great cast, of course, Ryan Reynolds and Jake Gyllenhaal, the Asian guy from Lost and some others. Rebecca Ferguson also did a great job here as one of the leads astronauts. This is the first capsule ever to come back from the planet. We have visual confirmation. I see it. This could be a major scientific breakthrough. Come on, 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 come on. Woo! It's going to be a big custody battle over this one. It was basically kind of like Alien. Basically played out the same way. But what was really interesting was the drama, the suspense of it, the way that the alien creature that they're trying to keep aboard and bring back to Earth and study it and stuff grows to something more deadly than what they're ready for. Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, who... Of course, Rose Zombieland uh, wrote this also. We're really big fans of their work. They always kind of bring us something a little bit different to a different genre and uh, very versatile. So in general, I really liked this movie. I thought it was really suspenseful and, and terrifying and done the right way. But there's one thing that really burned my fur. Now, throughout the entire movie, for a really innocuous reason, they named the alien Calvin. That's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but it doesn't really matter. They name it because some kids said, hey, name the alien after elementary school, Calvin Elementary or Middle School or whatever. It doesn't matter. But they continue to call it Calvin, not the crazy alien or the monster. So that kind of knocks the alien's menacing level down a peg. And it was just super annoying and really stupid. It kind of put a damper, a dark cloud over the enjoyment of this movie. Because Sure, we can give the benefit of the doubt sometimes, but this kind of was a piece of zebra meat stuck in my craw. We just thought it was very really thrilling and compelling the whole way. It was a smarter version of Alien. All right, up next is a, a big bomb of the year. People didn't like it a lot. We thought it was pretty cool and creative. Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. That right there alone, the title, is going to get some interest from us. Okay, we are huge sci-fi fans. This time, Dane DeHaan in a horribly miscast role in one of the lower parts of the movie. Even though we like him as an actor, not good in this kind of Keanu Reeves, whoa, role. Look, scored a perfect 200 on my last memory test. Impressive. 
The real breakthrough here was model turned actress who is getting better and better and does the best work here, Cara Delevingne. She was also in Suicide Squad you saw a couple years back. This time she gets to play full lead with Dane DeHaan. Clive Owen also is in it a little bit, Rihanna, you know. But the big draw, this is directed by Luc Bisson. It's very much in the same style of his uh, past Fifth Element. It's a CGI fuckfest for sure, so that might be some problems for some people. Crazy characters, crazy creatures... We wanted to know a little bit more about the world of the city of a thousand planets. I thought that part was a little bit left off. Generally, it's still lots of fun, a lot of great uh, adventure to be had. It's a definitely a cool thriller, uh, mystery aspect too. I know it lost some people because the French style is a little bit eccentric sometimes. Luc Besson can go a little bit wild, but we thought it was definitely fun and entertaining and worth their time watching. All right, well, thank you so much for watching this pretext to our awesome top 20 movies of 2017 please join us here on instagram and youtube for weekly unveilings of those movies we know you want the quick ones with the quick video and the full-on reviews of the movies so we're going to be doing the you know two three four minute reviews with the clips of one movie each time so thank you so much for joining us let us know what other ones you think uh, should make the list will justice league or wonder woman or it or get out or baby driver or some of the other great movies that came out this year be on the list uh, stay with us to find out we'll see now go forth and be awesome